आई वेलकम यू ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ मिशन गेस्ट्रो हॉस्पिटल फॉर अवर एकेडमिक इनिशिएटिव एंड टूडेज टॉपिक इज मैनेजमेंट अप्रोच एंड मैनेजमेंट ऑफ डिजिटल मैलिग्नेंट बिलेरी ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन एंड टूडे वी हैव अ वेरी एमिनेंट पैनलिस्ट एंड स्पीकर्स माय कलीग डॉक्टर धवल गुप्ता डॉक्टर हितेश चावड़ा सर श्रीधर सुंदरम Uh, he is uh, uh, my friend at KEN and Tata, and uh, Apurva sir. He, he is a uh, famous pathologist at our center, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rosil. He is the intervention radiologist, uh, and he is also had done his uh, fellowship oh, at Tata that. and in uh, Denmark. so i uh, without wasting a time i invite uh, dr dhawal gupta to start uh, his lecture okay. uh, thank you dr pradeep ah uh, uh, my slides are visible Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, we have our today's uh, topic of approach to the patients with malignant distal biliary obstruction. Uh, I will mainly uh, touch upon the uh, endoscopic uh, uh, parts of the um, endoscopic approach of the distal biliary obstruction, and uh, so we can give more time in the panel discussion. So uh, malignant obstructive jaundice. It is the impedance to the biliary flow due to the obstruction. to the biliary tree by the primary malignancy or the metastasis the common causes of the malignant obstructive jaundice are uh, depending upon the location whether hilar or the distal biliary obstruction in distal biliary obstruction the most common cause is the pancreatic cancer apart from that the metastatic disease to the uh, head of the pancreas or ampullary cancer or nodal compression and uh, uh, cagb and other extrinsic masses we will mainly focus on the uh, distal biliary obstruction uh, today Uh, despite the technological advances, only 20% of the periampullary tumors are found to be resectable at the time of presentation. And uh, as I already told, the CA pancreas is one of the uh, most common cause. So, uh, coming to the palliation of the uh, malignant obstructive jaundice, so why should we palliate it? Uh, jaundice uh, can cause the intense pleuritis, anorexia, weight loss uh, due to the fat malabsorption, also the deficiency of the fat soluble uh, vitamin, so may lead to the bleeding uh, and also the cholangitis. if we want to start the chemotherapy which may be curative or life prolonging so for such reasons the jaundice uh, should be palliated also the if the pain is there associated symptom which increases the suffering so on uh, right now for the uh, particularly for the resectable uh, malignant uh, cbd obstruction the current recommendation for the biliary drainage are very limited for the patients uh, who are the candidate for the neo adjuvant therapies or uh, if he is suffering from the cholangitis or if there is intense pleuritis and the delay in the surgery for more than 3 weeks and uh, also there are the different uh, criterias for the bilirubin according to the different studies uh, most of the studies have recommended more than 300 mg or more than 17.5 mg per cent so uh, what are the uh, methods of the palliation in the obstructive jaundice there are mainly three types of the uh, palliation uh, surgical percutaneous or the endoscopic uh, surgical uh, Uh, palliation advantage uh, is the lifelong palliation uh, is usual simultaneous palliation of the gastric outlet obstruction can be done and uh, also the palliation of the pain can be done but it is a uh, more invasive and quite morbid and also associated with the some mortality percutaneous drainage is the non surgical and uh, but it also associated with the some uh, inherent uh, problems with the pain bleeding external drains and endoscopic uh, procedures the advantages are the non surgical relatively painless it is a most of the time outpatient uh, procedure and uh, the disadvantage is the stents may occlude uh, expertise may vary depending upon the procedures for the us guided procedure uh, pro uh, interventionist may require the higher uh, expertise and also uh, complications so uh, what are the current uh, uh, recommendations uh, for the primary biliary drainage so the esg recommends that the decompression of the malignant extra hepatic biliary obstruction uh, should be performed by the ercp rather than by the surgery or percutaneously which is the strong recommendation in the 2015 guideline after that uh, esg recommends the, the rest, restricting the use of the eus guided biliary drainage to the cases where the biliary drainage using the standard ercp techniques have failed 
However, in the uh, latest uh, 2022 guideline, they have uh, suggested that the US guided biliary drainage could also be used in this setting for the inoperable patients at high volume expert centers. So uh, primarily ERCP is considered as the first line, but US can also be considered at the uh, higher centers. Now uh, coming to the surgical versus endoscopic approach. Uh, in most of the studies, the for the palliation, uh, we are talking about the uh, non-resectable distal miliary obstruction. The endoscopic procedures are associated with the lesser complications and uh, overall less mortality. Also, the quality of life is better uh, in the endoscopic uh, approach. And uh, duration of the hospital stay is also quite shorter in the endoscopic procedures. Comparing the uh, radiological procedures like the PTBD, uh, adverse events uh, were quite lower in the most of the studies with the all over lower cost and lower hospital uh, stay. And uh, many of the uh, studies have also showed no difference in the complication or the mortality. Now coming to the endoscopic part, uh, the indications are the inoperable disease, comorbidities, organ failure, advanced stage, severe malnutrition or unknown dissectability. The benefits we already uh, told that the relief of the jaundice and avoidance of the hepatotoxicity from the chemotherapeutic agents or to relieve the cholangitis. It is bound to have the, some uh, endoscopic risks like the pancreatitis, bleeding, perforation, and also sometimes violation of the sterile environment. Now, uh, prerequisite for the endoscopic palliation, we have to look for the symptoms of the gastric outlet obstruction. And also, we need to have the roadmap uh, before doing any procedure like the MRCP to know the exact location of the biliary obstruction or tumors to avoid the unnecessary contamination of the undrainable segments of the liver and prevent the hepatic abscess formation. And in complex structures involving both lobes of the liver, decide whether to drain one lobe or both lobes. This is particularly for the uh, above higher uh, area, but um, the goal of the uh, drain is to drain at least the 50% of the liver volume at the end of the procedure. Now investigations, uh, as I already told, MRCP and CT abdomen, other and that for undetermined biliary structure, we need to uh, do the brush cytology, also the US guided uh, FNA or FNB. Uh, we will discuss this uh, part uh, mainly in the panel discussion. So now I am not going into the detail of this. Uh, endoscopic palliation approach is the based on the, as I told, the location of the obstruction. Uh, in most of the uh, cases, the conventional ER suffice. suffice. If there is the gastric outlet obstruction, then uh, we may have to uh, take the US uh, biliary drainage, either intrahepatic or the US guided integral strain placement. Or if the patient is post surgical altered anatomy like the VIP post VIPL or UNY, then endoscopy assisted ER CP uh, we have to do. The clinical and technical success rates for the achieving the adequate palliation for the distal obstruction is better than uh, the all over, better than the hilar obstruction. The type of, of the endobiliary stents used mainly are the plastic and metal. Uh, plastic stents uh, vary in caliber, in length, material, and configuration. And most are made up of the polyurethane, uh, polyethylene, and also now uh, newer uh, stents are made up of the Teflon. Uh, mainly, we use the straight stents and pigtail stents. In currently, uh, in the routine practice, in the advanced malignancy, the uh, indication of the plastic stents are very limited when there is a cost constraint or uh, for a short period of time in the resectable cases for the cholangitis or to decrease the jaundice. In that scenario also, in most of the studies, they have shown that the SEMS is also better than the plastic stents in most of the studies. Uh, now coming to the self-expanding metal stents. Uh, it is developed. It was developed to increase the stent diameter, thereby reducing the recurrent obstruction. SEMS range from the four to twelve centimeter in length with diameter, when expanded ranging from the six to ten mm. Uh, there are a uh, lot of different uh, materials of the stents uh, are available. Uh, Nitylon is the dominant material for the SEMS because of its shape, memory, elasticity, and the ability to confirm the better two angulations in high radial resistive forces. All SEMS are radio opaque and most of the recent ones are the MRI condi conditional. So uh, SEMS can be covered or partially covered or uncovered. So uh, covering material can be PTFE or other uh, fluorinated ethylene polypropylene or silicon membranes. In uh, uncovered stents, uh, there is the uh, risk of the ingrowth, tumor ingrowth. But overall, uh, there is the less sense of the uh, stent migration. Uh, while in covered stents, uh, there is the risk of the uh, stent migration. These are the uh, just stent uh, shown as a fully covered stent, partially covered stent, and uncovered stent. In advanced uh, uh, non resectable uh, distal biliary obstruction, mainly we use the uncovered uh, SEMS. 
ESG recommends the SCMA insertion for the palliative or drainage of the malignant extrahepatic biliary obstruction. So generally, plastic stents we uh, use only when uh, for a short period of time or when the cost uh, constraint is there. Uh, as I told that in most of the studies, uh, SCMS have shown better performance uh, in the terms of the storm uh, stand patency, uh, stand occlusion time uh, is less, uh, survival is longer in the SCMS group. In most of the studies, they have shown the survival benefit in the SCMS group. Now, uh, comparison between the covered and uncovered stands. Uh, in uh, many studies, uh, they have shown the increased migration uh, with the covered stand. Uh, but also uh, in lot of analysis, they have shown there is the, uh, no such uh, uh, correlation. And uh, there was the uh, uh, risk of the cholecystitis with the covered stent. But uh, if we keep the stent uh, below the uh, cystic duct origin, then uh, this can also be avoided. So if there is a malignant distal biliary structure from the, uh, particularly from the pancreatic cancer, if it is resectable and if the patient is to be going to be operated within one to two weeks, then there is no need of the uh, drainage. If the delay to the operation or the pre-operative treatment is planned, then uh, metal stent is recommended. If there is a borderline resectable or locally advanced, then of course, SEMS is better. And in metastatic disease also, the SEMS is uh, preferable. Now, complications of the endoscopic palliation, uh, stent occlusion because of the tumor ingrowth or outgrowth and or occlusion by the sludge. Regenerative in this can lead to the non-malignant tissue in growth or the overgrowth. A stent migration, it is possible in 1-2% to of the patients. Uncovered SEM is presumably secondary to the embedding of the stent into the, both the tumor and the surrounding normal tissue in 6-8% with the covered SEM is. Sphincterotomy may also be a risk factor for this stent migration. As I already told, cholecystitis may occur if the covered stent is placed across the origin of the cystic duct, resulting in the functional gallbladder obstruction. Cholangitis in case of the incomplete drainage. Other complications can be uh, perforation, bleeding, fistula, pancreatitis. Now, uh, what are the uh, guidelines for the blocked or the non-functional stent? ESG suggests that the patient with the distal malignant biliary structure and non-functional stent, a plastic stent should be replaced by the SEMS. And in case of the SEMS, a plastic stent or a new SEMS should be inserted within the original SEMS. However, it was the weak recommendation. Now coming to the US guided biliary drainage. So what are the indications of the uh, US guided biliary drainage? Uh, it is mainly alternative uh, for the PTBD after the failed ERCP. Uh, advantages of the US guided drainage are the minimally invasive with minimal or no procedural pain can be performed directly after a failed ERCP in the same session by the same proceduralist. Drainage of the both the intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts. And as opposed to the PT body, there is no external drain that can dislocate or that limit the patient's uh, daily activities. Shorter hospital stay is expected and a reported adverse event rates are far lower than for the uh, PT body. Complications can be cholangitis, hemorrhage, pancreatitis, bile leaks, sepsis, and peritonitis. Stand migration in the peritoneal cavity and fetal pore perforations can occur, but uh, they are quite rare. Now, uh, which are the US guided biliary drainage techniques? Uh, the in a non inferiority trial uh, showed that the US biliary drainage has the comparable clinical and technical success to the conventional ERCP uh, with the transpapillary uh, stenting for the primary palliation of the malignant distal biliary obstruction. The choice of the technique depends upon the inherent reason for the failed conventional ERCP, uh, anatomical constraints, as well as the indication for the biliary drainage and operator preference. There are the four techniques primarily for the US biliary drainage depending upon the location of the biliary assays, whether it is intrahepatic versus extrahepatic, and the location of the stent deployment, whether it is a transpapillary versus the transgastric or transcentric. Now, uh, intrahepatic approach, there are mainly two types, US guided hepaticogastrostomy and US guided integral stent placement. In hepaticogastrostomy, uh, the biliary assays is done from the stomach through the dilateral left intrahepatic duct and deploying the stent from the LIHD into the stomach. And while in the integral stent, uh, stent placement, uh, deploying the stent in a transpapillary integrated fashion across the structure of the obstruction, same like uh, USHG, but the stent is um, pushed further uh, through the papilla into the duodenum. Now the extra epidic approach, US guided choladico duodenostomy, which consists of the assessing the biliary tree from the duodenal bulb through the common bile duct or the common hepatic duct and deploying the stent from the 
CBD or CHD into the small bowel lumen. Stent can also be deployed in the transpapillary position using the rendu uh, technique from either the intrahepatic or extrahepatic approach. Uh, so basically, uh, it is showing that uh, uh, through the stomach, it is a hepatico uh, gastrostomy, or it can be assessed uh, through the um, choroidic or uh, duodenostomy. Now, hepatic, uh, US carried hepatico gastrostomy. The main indications are the gastric outlet obstruction when we cannot uh, insert the ear scope through into the duodenum. If ampulla is not accessible, or if there is a failed cannulation, or when there is a left lobe cannot be drained by the ear and also in the surgically altered anatomy after the Whipple or the Ruin Y. What are the contraindications of the hepatico gastrostomy? The tumor infiltration along the stomach wall, which is the absolute contraindication. Also, the massive ascites, coagulopathy, and lack of the uh, left intrahepatic duct dilatation. These are the relative contraindications. Now, US get a hepatico gastrostomy. As I told, that uh, uh, dilated uh, left intrahepatic ducts are assessed uh, particularly in the segment 3. Uh, there should be a suggested distance should be the one to three centimeter between the LIHD and the stomach wall. And the goal of the bile duct diameter should be more than five millimeter. Once the guide wire is advanced into the bile duct towards the hilum, a fistulous track creation is performed using the dilating balloon and the stent is deployed over that. Now, uh, what is the US guided integral stent placement? It is uh, similar to the SGS, but stent is deployed across the area of the obstruction within the bile duct into the small intestine and metal stents are preferred. Uh, U.S. Keratic uh, Choleric Duodenostomy, it is mainly used when the extrahepatic uh, portion of the CBD is dilated due to the distal obstruction. A stent is then deployed between the duodenal lumen and the extrahepatic biliary tree. And as uh, previously told, the metal stents are always uh, preferred. Lumen opposing metal stents have also shown the high technical and clinical success ratio. Rendezvous technique indicated when uh, the second portion of the duodenum is accessible, but conventional ERCP failed by the papilla. And uh, when there is a presence of large periampullary diverticulum or there is an ampullary tumor. And Dr. Vinay, their study has shown that the uh, US rendezvous is superior to the pre-cut papillotomy for the procedural success, although there was no difference in the procedural complications. Uh, rendezvous technique biliary assess is often, as I told previously, the guide wire is directed across the ampulla into the small bowel, and the needle and the echo endoscopes are then removed, and then standard duodenoscope or ERCP scope is inserted into the level of the ampulla, and then the wire is gra grasped using the forceps or snare and withdrawn through the accessory channel in the scope, and then the conventional ERCP is performed. Uh, what are the studies? Uh, what studies says between the intrahepatic and extrahepatic approach? In uh, many studies, uh, they have shown that uh, procedural trying, post-procedural pain and complications, uh, hospital admissions and mortality are quite shorter in the extra hepatic route. This is the for the uh, cholerico duodenostomy patients. But uh, however, the success rate was the all over same. Dr. Khasab's study has shown that the uh, procedural trying and length of the hospital stay and risk of the moderate adverse events were quite lower in the extra hepatic route. Uh, Technical success ratio in many studies that they have shown almost similar. And uh, in also many studies and meta-analysis, they have shown the equal efficacy and safety of the hepatico gastrostomy and choleric So ESG recommend uh, that the, there is uh, supports the use of the US guided choleric duodenostomy over the US guided hepatico gastrostomy in the distal biliary obstruction, owing to its uh, lower rates of the adverse events. And they also suggest the US guided biliary drainage in, drainage in the malignant post surgical biliary obstruction and long biliary limb with a dilated intrahepatic bile ducts. So, uh, what is the approach uh, in the malignant distal biliary obstruction? When uh, there is expected a difficult cannulation or altered anatomy, then US guided biliary drainage preferred. If there is expected easy and normal cannulation, then of course the ERCP is the first line treatment. If there is a failed ERCP, then uh, we can go for the US guided biliary drainage. And uh, in US guided biliary drainage, if there are the dilated intrahepatic ducts, then the, we can go for the intrahepatic approach. If it is a failed or not feasible, then the extrahepatic approach. And if there are the non dilated intrahepatic ducts, then the extrahepatic approach is preferred. That is the choleric or duodenostomy. Although the ESG now recommends the uh, extrahepatic is uh, much safer as compared to the intrahepatic route. Uh, endoscopic palliation for the malignant bile duodenal obstruction. 
ESG suggests that the endoscopic insertion of the biliary SEMS and the uncovered duodenal SEMS in patients with the both biliary and duodenal malignant obstruction. And uh, for uh, uh, malig both malignant uh, biliary obstruction, that endoscopic approach has shown the uh, decreased time uh, to the, I mean, most of the studies they found to be uh, much better as compared to the surgical approach. And also in many studies, they have shown the uh, some survival benefit also. Uh, now, endoscopic palliation for the malignant uh, biliodural obstruction that US grad gastroenterostomy is uh, uh, recently have shown that uh, quite uh, uh, comparable to the surgical and uh, but although that expertise is uh, required you uh, using the lumen opposing SEMS, uh, which was recently introduced in two retrospective studies by the Chen and Dr. Kashab has shown to have the compared to the surgery and enteral stenting and lower incidence of the symptom recurrence and less need for the re-intervention compared with the enteral stenting. So to summarize, uh, if there is a digital malignant biliary obstruction, if it is resectable, yes. If there is cholangitis or a delay in the surgery, if there is new adjuvant therapies planned, if bilirubin is more than 17.5 milligram, yes, then uh, we should uh, drain it. And uh, if it is a uh, papillize accessible, then uh, we should directly go with the ERCP and uh, uh, CMS placement. Uh, in such cases, we have to put a uh, short uh, length, uh, uh, short length SEMS because uh, they are going to get operated. And if a papilla is not accessible, then uh, we can go for the PTBD or the EUS guided. And there are no such uh, indication, then the patient can directly go for the resection. If patient is non-resectable, then again, the if the papilla is accessible or not, depending on that, we can go for the ERCP or the EUS guided uh, biliary drainage based on the location of the uh, structure or uh, uh, local expertise availability and considering all the factors. Uh, thank you. I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Pratin. Uh. Uh, thank you, Dawal, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Now I would invite uh, Dr. Hitesh Chavda. He is a chief uh, GI surgeon at uh, Sterling Hospital. In, uh, he, is a, he has a very vast experience in uh, managing such a compli complex GI cases. So uh, now I will invite Dr. Uh, Hitesh Chawda sir for his lecture. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, thanks uh, Mission Gastro for arranging this session and I welcome all the panelists. Uh, I'm going to touch upon a uh, few aspects of uh, surgery for distal biliary uh, obstruction due to malignancy. There is going to be some overlap uh, uh, on what Devil has said. So uh, the common causes are pancreatic malignancy. About 70-80% of pancreatic tumor will have uh, tumor in the in the head. So that's a common reason. Cholangio, ampullary, CA gallbladder, or metastatic nodes they are the common reasons. Uh, the incidence is increasing. The diagnostic and therapeutic challenge is always there for such patients. Uh, surgery is a mainstay of uh, getting long-term survival in such patients. And many a times it can be a very complex uh, surgery. Uh, most of the patients will have advanced disease at the time of presentation. So that's going to be, again, a challenge. And the most important thing is a tissue diagnosis because many of the patients will go here and there and to get a correct tissue diagnosis is very difficult. The prognosis is poor, but the overall outcome has increased in the last uh, one or two decades due to uh, better intervention, better post-operative care, and good imaging. So diagnosis, mainly, I would say liver function test uh, is very important. If, if a patient has a high bilirubin on presentation, it is important. If he has painless jaundice, with high bilirubin, we must suspect malignancy. So that is very important. And of course, tumor markers that we'll discuss in the uh, panel, and these are the other things like CT, MR, uh, ERCP, cytology, cholangioscopy, and EUS, FNS, all these are diagnostic. So uh, what important thing that a surgeon is looking for is when there is a biliary obstruction due to mass, then we have to find out what that mass is, whether it is a malignancy or whether it's a benign thing. So if there is a mass, then we know that most of the time it is going to be malignancy. Very rarely it can be benign. So if there is no mass, then we must exclude malignancy or benign condition because 
many a times uh, when we uh, when we approach this patient there is no mass and some of patients are stented outside then it is very difficult to imagine them uh, when they come to us so we must exclude uh, stricture in the in the lower uh, bile duct uh, when there is no mass like ig uh, g4 cholangitis or primary sclerosis cholangitis or uh, the other reasons for cholangitis that must be excluded before we 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 subject this patient for surgery so management includes a surgical resection that's the mainstay and endoscopic or percutaneous treatment and and palliative surgery so the excessive i mean the assessment of resectability depends on the performance status of the person because it's going to be a major resection liver function test the the extent of the uh, tumor the vascular involvement uh, nodal disease or distant metastasis so all this has to be access prior to surgery and just uh, double say uh, for the resectable tumor surgery directly is is very good it will give a good uh, outcome but some of this patient will need a preoperative biliary drainage as you said cholangitis or very symptomatic jaundice or when we are going to delay surgery or patients who have borderline resectable cancer who are having a new adjuvant chemotherapy so these are the patients who will need uh, preoperative biliary drainage and palliation as uh, double has already discussed can be can be done by our medical colleagues so for resectable cases the aim is to have an r0 resection so all the tumor tissue has to be resected and this is the aim to achieve a long term survival so in in lower bile duct structure the or the lower bile duct malignant obstruction uh, the surgery is going to be a uh, pancreatic odontectomy so a uh, vipal operation is the is the main uh, thing that we, we we offers to such patient i'm not going to go in technical uh, detail because the the crowd is mixed so a uh, pancreatic odontectomy is a major uh, surgical thing that that is offered to uh, such patients now preoperative biliary drainage uh, it's still controversial for uh, for resectable patient when it is when it is it is offered this is important for surgeons not all the patients they need preoperative biliary drainage so uh, we must understand that the earlier series and and the recent work also shows that uh, we have to try to avoid preoperative -pre biliary drainage because if we try to uh, try to uh, drain such patients who have painless jaundice not high uh, high bilirubin they land up with post operative particularly infective complications so this is important not all the patients uh, needs uh, biliary drainage the patients who have cholangitis severe pruritus uh, when when they are going to wait due to new adjuvant therapy all of them should have preoperative drainage otherwise they should have direct surgery uh, if if they are operable uh, regarding the borderline resectable uh, pancreatic cancer uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, new thing that is coming up now uh, as many of these patients have locally advanced disease uh, which is borderline resectable at time of presentation so these patients don't go for upfront resection they receive uh, new adjuvant therapy they have good preoperative workup and uh, to exclude uh, distant metastases some of them they also have a diagnostic laparoscopy and uh, the distant metastases is excluded they have received uh, Uh, chemotherapy mostly folferinox or gemstabin based plus minus radiotherapy uh, they are downsized and again they are they are excessive there is no progression of the tumor if there is a regression then it is taken as a positive sign and then they undergo an exploration and an r0 resection is tried to achieve and again followed by adjuvant therapy so uh, it is found that this patient uh, will have high rate of negative margins and it improves uh, overall survival so many of the patients that we see uh, will now qualify for uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy regarding palliative bypass if you see the earlier series uh, many patients uh, when we were resident we used to do uh, palliative bypass for uh, uh, unresectable tumors but uh, as the technology advance as the endoscopic procedures have become routine uh, the palliative bypass is not a common procedure that we do unless uh, a patient uh, who is very fit symptomatic patient has is opened up for uh, curative resection if he is having biliary uh, obstruction as well as a duodenal obstruction we probably have palliative bypass at the same time uh, because they will have a good palliation uh, if you think that the patient's uh, disease is not that much advanced a good performance status and if the life expectancy is good then probably 
uh, surgical resection, I mean, surgical uh, bypass is, 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 is uh, offered. Otherwise, uh, for asymptomatic patient, uh, these are the patients who will go uh, undergo a metallic stenting uh, to give a good palliation. So this is important uh, to understand who should have a palliative bypass and who should not have. So uh, in current scenario, uh, palliative surgery or palliative bypass surgery is not a general uh, thing that is done. Uh, rather, these patients are offered uh, metallic stenting. So the surgeon's concern uh, are operability. So a preoperative, good imaging, uh, the extent of the tumor, the vascular involvement, this is very, very crucial. Second thing is we must exclude benign pathology because patients is undergoing a major resection and we don't want to land up with a benign condition at the end because there is going to be some mortality in patients who undergo whipple surgery. Third thing is unindicated stenting because if the ultrasound report uh, showing some doubtful stones, patient will undergo straight away ERCP and stenting. These are the patients who will have an MRI or a CT, will not detect small tumor because of the artifact of the stent. And the, the surgery is delayed. So to, to again evaluate such patients, are difficult and they will, again, you know, some of them will have a stand blockage, cholangitis, and the whole thing delays. So we don't want unindicated stenting. So any patient who undergoes uh, ERCP stenting for biliary obstruction must have a proper CT scan and MRI, everything before they are stented, uh, maybe EUS to find out stone. Uh, and we must exclude malignancy, try to take a sample or EF, EUS FNA, uh, and then uh, otherwise after stenting, sometimes if the imaging is not done, it becomes very difficult uh, to access this patient. And as I said, palliative bypass uh, only in selected patients. So uh, I will quickly summarize that uh, surgical resection with negative margin is the only hope for the patients who have malignant biliary obstructions. And aggressive therapy in early stage disease without delay will give a better outcome. It is always uh, a team approach with uh, gastroenterologists, uh, surgeons, uh, medical uh, oncologists, and uh, interventional radiologists, and extended surgery with vascular resection uh, uh, in, a, in a specialized center is challenging, but will uh, give uh, a good outcome if it is done um, uh, in a good technical hand. And of course, a patient selection is uh, very, very important uh, when we talk for this uh, type of surgery, a good preoperative imaging a good liver function, a control of sepsis, and a good performance status. So if all this is done, then probably uh, this, these uh, patients will do well uh, uh, after surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tawla sir, for a wonderful lecture. Now I would invite Dr. Ruzil Gandhi for his talk. He is an intervention radiologist and he had a lot of experience in doing such cases. Uh, you thank you for the your lecture. Mission Gastro team for inviting me. Wonderful uh, series of uh, talks. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, everybody. So, what is the role of intervention radiologist in malignant uh, distal CBD stricture? Uh, you were very nicely explained by Chowda sir and Dhawal sir that uh, importance of diagnosis, staging uh, to see for the obstructive jaundice and uh, whether the patient uh, is planned for curate, curative or palliative treatment or just symptomatic treatment. Uh, as an intervention radiologist, I don't get to choose our patients. Basically, I'm referred when, uh, in this, especially in distal CBD obstructions, when uh, uh, this failure of endoscopic uh, procedure or ERCP has been attempted or an EUS has been attempted or because of some anatomical issues, endoscopic could not occur. Then only uh, I'm referred for a PTPD. So what all things can we do is we do PTBD 
generally it is a, a common uh, thing that ptpd is just a biliary drainage and there is some tube jutting out of the body but it is not so we we can and we generally also put metal stents also so there is nothing like an external drain lifetime uh in metastatic disease we are referred for biopsies and uh, there is also an endobiliary rf sometimes it can be used biopsy of an uh, for a pancreatic mass it is an opd procedure it is done under ultrasound or ct guidance uh, it is done under local less costly and uh, other thing is we can also take biopsies from the liver mass also for ptbd uh, generally when the patient is has contraindication to anesthesia as cholangitis and on pressure supports we are called for as i told when the patient uh, uh, has a failure of endoscopic procedure or there is a anatomical issue like in bariatric surgery done before and sometimes a patient who don't wish for endoscopy or anesthesia uh, and sometimes it is done in pre operative setting advantages are it is minimally invasive minimal complications done under fluoro guidance in cath lab uh, the first puncture is done under ultrasound guidance this is how the biliary duct puncture is done and it is done under local anesthesia so there is no uh, complications of anesthesia also basically ptvd was done first time in 1956 first ptc gram diagnostic was done in 1937 so it is done since 60 years now endoscopic came in 1980s and uh, with a good technological advancement and with good needles and wires uh, it is a safe procedure now uh, we generally see for the coagulation profile give inject uh, vitamin k injections start antibiotics shaving of the parts basically it's a sterile procedure uh, so the chance of infection are less Uh, we punch the liver with an 18 gauge or a 21 gauge needle, and uh, using Seldinger technique, wire is inserted, and over a wire catheter or a drainage catheter is inserted. If the plan is for palliation, uh, we try to pass the wire across the occlusion and insert stents. Just a schematic diagram. Uh, just showing one example: middle-aged female. Here, type two obstruction, not a distal CBD, but type two. ERCP and stent was done. There is a plastic stent inserted inside, and you can see multiple cholangitic abscess on the PTC gram. And uh, for this patient, biliary external biliary drainage was done. These are the abscesses, and this is the post removed uh, after PTBD. so we have multiple approaches also for the ptbd in distal cbd obstruction now we have right duct and left duct approach right duct approach is easier safer than the left duct and uh, in the right duct approach uh, there is less radiation to the operator that is an added advantage this is a left duct approach but the this all approach is they are age old but now what we do is we insert needle under ultrasound guidance this are all approaches uh, done in blind techniques but now with advent of ultrasound and portable ultrasound machines uh, all the punches are done only under ultrasound guidance as i told right duct is preferred because more of hepatic parenchyma on right side so less chance of biliary leaks um better uh, maneuverability of the wire from the right side what we take care in cholangitis patients we inject less contrast do less manipulation we try for 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minutes for the wire to pass across the occlusion if it doesn't pass we try next time we keep external drain and so that the bile and the infective material is removed and the patient after the patient stabilizes we can anyway do the procedure once again so the same puncture This is just an ex. This is a pictorial catheter. This is an external drainage catheter, and this is internal external drainage catheter. If we don't wish to put a stent across, we have option. This is a uh, this is a um, 
pigtail end, the round end remains in the duodenum, where these are the holes that remains in the binder. So this is an internal external drainage catheter. Uh, with holes across the occlusion, on the distal end of the occlusion also and the proximal end of the occlusion also. This is, suppose this is a mass, the internal external drainage catheter has multiple holes, distal and also proximal to the occlusion. As I explained, external drainage has the uh, holes only proximal to the occlusion. It is least secure and the less length of uh, drainage catheter is there inside the body. So there is chance of uh, accidental removal or accidental displacement of the gas. And it can be clamped. Peritubal leaks or tube droplets or accidental removal are the most common complication of PTBD. And uh, bleeds uh, we, uh, go through the liver parenchyma, so there is chance of uh, bleeding from the uh, parenchyma. And whenever the tube blockage, there is a chance of infection also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosil, for a wonderful lecture. Now, I will invite all my panelists, uh, Dr. Apuro Shah and uh, uh, Dr. Sridhar Sundaram. And I think uh, Dr. Chirag will also join in soon. So uh, we can uh, start panel discussion. Uh, I will share my screen. Santos, can you share my screen? You need to share from your side only, sir. Uh, I think my laptop uh, touchpad is not stopped working just from immediate effect. <laughs> just a minute, I can try. Okay, uh, one minute. Just now it's showing. I'm not able to share my screen. Just a minute. Anyways, I can ask a question directly. Yeah. I, that would be an option. So my uh, first question to uh, uh, yes. uh, Chavda sir, how do you decide on type of surgery? Uh, I think you have discussed in your talks, but I think it needs worth mentioning. See, basically, uh, lower malignant biliary obstruction will need a Whipple surgery. For uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma uh, in the lower bile duct, uh, we have to take biopsy of the upper margin because there may be extension upwards. That is important. So we might have to, you know, go, go up if there is a a vertical extension that is one secondly uh, for uh, pancreatic malignancy uh, we must look for vascular invasion because uh, there may be a portal vein or smv involvement so we have may have to resect portal vein or smv and do a vascular reconstruction so uh, so that will all depend on what we see in the preoperative imaging and what we find at the time of surgery with intraoperative frozen biopsy. So that is the decision is taken intraoperative, but we must anticipate what we are going to find preoperatively. So our team is ready, our graphs are ready, everything is ready in theater. So that is important and frozen as well. Okay, second, when do you prefer preoperative biliary drainage over the bile duct surgery? That I already discussed. So 
uh, yes 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 if the patient is asymptomatic I... even we have done whipple surgery in a patient with 20 bilirubin or maybe a little more so there is no point training all the patient if patient has cholangitis if you are going to wait if he is not fit we we have to build him up if if he is not going to come early so all these are the indications as all all of us have discussed we will have uh, a pre operative bilirubin training otherwise we don't want to do that Uh, sir this is a com- practical question do you want a tissue diagnosis of operable pancreatic head mass over direct surgery see uh, eus is now available so uh, i would prefer if if you can get it you know tissue diagnosis pre operatively if there is a definitive mask uh, if you can take it it is good but even if you take it and if the biopsy is negative and if there is high index of suspicion on 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 uh, on imaging then anyway these patients are going to have uh, you know uh, surgical resection so uh, we wish to have it pre operatively but uh, it is not possible every time and sir what is your approach when uh, repeated cytology is come negative and patient have uh, malig- uh, suspected malignant biliary structure so so this is a problem so uh, we do get patient who present to us with you know jaundice and on workup we find that there is a stricture on mri we are not unable to rule out malignancy so uh, we need to look for primary sclerosing cholangitis you know patients of all detail history to check for ulcerative colitis igg4 you know eosinophilic everything we must rule out everything uh, uh pre operatively so uh, if possible maybe we can go for a cholangoscopy or if it is available that is a good investigation to you know because these patients will again have a major surgery with already jaundice somebody has stented so all this problem is always there so in such patient we will have to remove the stent first they will have to do a cholangoscopy uh, take a biopsy Uh, maybe uh, intraductal ultrasound to see for any abnormal area take biopsy and rule out malignancy because the implications of surgery are you know much more than uh, conservative for a for for a benign disease so if patient has something benign and you subject them for for whipple will be too much for them so uh, they need aggressive treatment particularly then when there is no mass only stricture so that is important okay uh, now i ask a question to shield uh, shield is a uh, aggressive endoscopist so i will ask question to him what is your approach of biliary drainage in presence of gastric outlet obstruction uh so so uh, in presence of gastric outlet obstruction usually uh, if crcp is not feasible uh, i would of course prefer doing an us biliary drainage now uh, i mean from experience uh, i am personally in favor of uh, doing anti grade drainages over uh, fistulizing procedures like hepatico gastrostomy or colitico duodenostomy so uh, that's again out of personal preference but uh, again in patient with geo i would of prefer doing a us biliary drainage uh, if failed then maybe send for a ptbd if failed okay what is the indication of biliary drainage especially when bilirubin is low uh so yeah i i mean i think uh, uh, sir uh, i think chatra sir already uh, spoke about the different indications for pre operative biliary drainage so again those indications apply here even at the low biliary drainage the patient is planned for a newer joint therapy or in situations where uh, you are i mean the surgery is of course going to be delayed by more than 4 weeks you will do that and in situations where you are palliating uh, the, the disease is advanced you you might go ahead for biliary drainage but otherwise uh, uh, no real indication if the disease is otherwise operable and if the patient is fit for surgery okay what is preferred uh, on site cytology or fnb so uh, we have been studying this prospectively and uh, uh, to be very frank uh, if you're looking at fnb the, the the data i mean even the recent ga- trial in gastroenterology would suggest that we can uh, just uh, uh, on site cytology is no longer uh, uh, needed so with the newer needles i think uh, we can supersede on site on site cytology directly go ahead with fnb this is our experience as well we uh, recently presented our data at iscon and again uh, that is a paper that is presenting at ddw this year 
so we found in in our series also that uh, uh, you know fmd was as good as uh, doing fmd with uh, rose so i don't see the need for rose especially with the newer needles coming in especially i mean with the tip uh, the needles were wearing uh, the not the side cutting ones but the ones with the uh, tip cutting needles so like acquire or maybe shark core the there is really no need for cytology what is the indication of ampullectomy or repulse surgery so uh, so ampullectomy this is a tricky sit- question because uh, ampullectomy will primarily be done only in situations where you have an ampullary adenoma uh, if there is a biopsy so as per recommendation uh, for any ampullary tumor if even if you're planning an ampullectomy initially you have to biopsy and prove that it's an adenoma and unless it's 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 a proven adenoma you would not go ahead with an ampullectomy uh, unless of course you have a very small tumor let's say a t1 ampullary tumor less than 2 cm in size patient is unfit for undergoing a whipple and uh, the morbidity and mortality anticipated with the whipple is a lot more maybe only in that situation will will uh, you know a t1 uh, ad- ampullary carcinoma will you actually resect but otherwise it is always an ampullary adenoma that you will do an endoscopic ampullectomy what is your take on primary us guided biliary drainage over ERCP? Uh, so uh, again uh, so there is there is uh, there is some amount of data uh, that has come up on this uh, there is a, there are i think a recent meta analysis also published uh, which six trials which said that us uh, uh, requires lesser reintervention uh, with similar technical success and clinical success but again uh, considering the the expertise available i would suggest that ERCP still remains the primary choice over and above uh, uh, you know going ahead with usbd and then of course your center has been doing a lot of us videos uh, what is the role of igg4 in uh, when we, uh, okay. you whether you do routinely igg4 level or you do in selective cases of biliary uh, obstruction so so selective cases only uh, the cohort that we see uh, in tata is reasonably advanced so uh, igg4 uh, still remains a rare entity so uh, again this is another another uh, another study that we recently presented at the isd meeting this year uh, with 31 patients over the last 8 years so i mean it's a rare disease so uh, your primary uh, diagnosis differential would remain uh, uh, you know a malignancy unless proven otherwise so i would not do ig4 in every patient uh, and like sir said cytology negative ones are the tricky patients what we've started doing for cytology negative has been we've started doing uh, rose as in addition to uh, you know taking a routine brush cytology so i maybe add a cytologist who can take better samples from our brush cytology so that has actually improved our yield so maybe something that 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 we can publish prospectively but otherwise not routinely recommended ig4 only for selected patients so you recommend to do when you do cbd breast cytology during ercp you want a cytopathologist on site so we have been trying that i mean last uh, so this is a new pilot study that we are doing so uh, it is something that i guess more people can attempt and uh, see how their experience is we have had a good experience with our pilot so far and uh, we are in the process of maybe publishing that so uh, i guess uh, we'll find out if if more more centers start doing it because our data right. may be biased because uh, the cytologies differ from center to center yes, i have yes. a question sir yeah yeah yes please please so you can ask you liquid based cytology while collecting sample yes yes we've started doing that we've started doing that so uh, can you prepare cell block from that yeah so our cytologist does that so we've started doing liquid based cytology in addition to the routine brush that we were taking so uh, so that again maybe increases the yield in some way and uh, have you established fish on the liquid based cytology samples uh, so that is uh, been a problem uh, so establishing that on the liquid based cytology is still uh, uh, it's it's something that we are trying to do now so uh, uh, i mean the we are working closely with our uh, gi pathologists this is some this is again another area that we are actually trying to expand on so maybe uh, i'll have the answer maybe uh, Maybe, maybe maybe the next time okay thank you okay thanks now let's come in my something with my laptop there is a problem
So my next question is to Dhawal. What is your approach in previously negative breast cytology patients? Is unmute. I mean, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, the other. You are uh, not yes, audible. Yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, it was. You have to repeat it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in uh, distal uh, biliary obstruction, uh, if the breast cytology is negative, then uh, US is uh, one of the modality. And uh, for a proximal uh, obstruction, then uh, if the cholangioscopy is available, then we can use that. Also, for the cytology, uh, we can add. Uh, that uh, fish uh, that uh, Dr. Apurva sir will uh, tell us about later on. And uh, of course, there is a role of uh, PET CT in uh, some Hyler uh, uh, cholangio. So, uh, but if it is a uh, possible, we can take uh, US guided uh, FNA or B uh, from that uh, lesion if it is possible. I think Dr. Peter can tell us more about that. <laughs> When do you do EUS or CCT in digital video after? Or you do both? Generally, in a routine practice, we do uh, both. Uh, first, uh, we do primarily a CCT in almost all patients because in USG, uh, generally, we uh, do not get uh, most of the information. So, most of the time, we have to do primarily a CCT and before uh, any invasive procedure. So, routinely, we do uh, both. In uh, disturbability <laughs> obstruction. And uh, when do you prefer your patient directly to surgery without biliary drainage? As already uh, Chavda Sarah told that when the patient is not uh, uh, very high bilirubin, like less than 10 or 15, and no cholangitis and localized disease resectable, then uh, we can directly send patient for the uh, resection. Uh, I will ask a question to Dr. Rosil. Uh, what is your uh, what is the indication of PTBD over ERCP? Primary PTBD over ERCP. I think this is also discussed. I think for gastric outlet obstruction and when uh, there is no P uh, EUS uh, feasible or not available. Yes, yes. And uh, absolute contraindication of PTBD is uh, gross ascites and. Uh, Coagulopathy, severe coagulopathy. So that is a absolute contraindication. And if we had a patient with liver metastasis, also liver mats, then? Uh, even if there are many mats, we still can do PTBD. We can target the dilated binders for palliation. Yes. Okay. But uh, okay. SITs and coagulopathy are gross uh, contraindications. Yes. Uh, now, I had a question to uh, Apuro sir. How, uh, one is to uh, whenever we send a, uh, uh, slides for cytology, uh, they say uh, you do alcohol dry or air dry, and uh, sometimes they want us to be uh, want their pathologist to be on site uh, for better results. So how uh, sir how uh, how how to send a biliary uh, this cytology slides? for increase the yield so there are i think when you are collecting the sample there are three things which you can do one is you can make smear yourself on the slide that is one thing if you have blood clot or any clotted material or if you have done the biopsy so that you put in the formalin and third thing is uh, which is not available here is liquid based cytology so there are specialized container with a preservative where you just put the brush in the that container and then we'll proceed that container later on. So you don't have to make the slides for that liquid based cytology. So there are three things now. First thing is a smear now. So uh, generally we do two types of stain on the smear. One is a Leishman or Jimsa stain. Those are better to study the hematolymphoid cells. So when you're suspecting IgG folate disease and we have to study plasma cells, you would like to do a Leishman or Jimsa stain. For that smear should be air dry. 
nothing should be added to the smear so add right smear we do lishman and jimsa stain then uh, for malignancy we always do pap stain so those smears need to be fixed with alcohol so alcohol fix alcohol fix smears are required to diagnose malignancy so we prefer both actually if you according to your clinical suspicion if you are suspecting ig for a disease then we would, we, would, we would prefer more or a dried smears if you are suspecting malignancy we would prefer more fixed smears so that is one thing uh, now liquid based cytology there is a different issue which uh, we are not doing as of now and biopsy or clotted material in the cell block to prepare cell block so which we can do further testing uh, so how to send material for ihc and uh, any advantage of uh, doing ihc and fish over the only routine cytology yeah so for histopathology and we want to do ihc generally ihc is not established practice on the smears so we need a but tissue okay. material or a biopsy to do the ihc so we need a biopsy or a clot material to do ihc or a block for that now uh, generally uh, cbd brushing has a low sensitivity and high specificity a lot of problems with uh, uh, drying artifact less material because of stricture so the sensitivity is low uh, now uh, in addition to that if, if the stent or stone are present that will cause reactive atp also so that will clinically mimic uh, cytologic microscopically mimic malignancy also if there is a stone or stent already in there which when which will cause reactive atp so uh, there are certain tests which can be done with a fish fish is generally fluorescent in situ hybridization which can be established from the liquid based cytology material only not from smear or not on biopsy so uh, there are certain chromos the commercially available kits are available to certain chromosomes like chromosome 3 7 17 and 9 and generally malignancy causes an euploidy so there will be increased number of signals for this chromosome if it is positive then it will it will, it will lead to diagnosis of malignancy so it can increase your sensitivity to, to like 60 70% uh, there are certain ihc markers uh, like dpc4 or cd10 loss or tumor suppressor gene p53 or expression so this can help in establishing the diagnosis but you have to put everything together clinical imaging cytology diagnosis and immunohistochemical finding all together but these are not routinely uh, used actually ihc and fish are not routinely used i think anywhere in india uh, when i was in tata uh, some of my colleagues used to send bile uh, aspirated bile for the cytology is it uh, recommended uh, for cytology or you need only brushing i think both will be fine actually so we prefer both give, give cytology as well as biopsy possible so one one of them will hit the lesion no. so sometimes um, so we what... get cyt diagnosis in cytology not in biopsy sometimes we get not in cytology in biopsy so vice no. versa uh, so so uh, what is the yield of brush cytology sensitivity is very low i think 50% okay so we need additional information from the radiologically and another uh, parameter blood parameter to support a diagnosis yes yes and we will be okay. happy to write that stenting and stone detail in request okay i think uh, that is the message uh, for everybody uh, for surgeon side and as well as from pathologist side uh, so before doing stenting or something you should take a diagnostic uh, cytology or biopsy and then if in required do a stenting okay uh, thank you uh, everybody uh, i would like to thank uh, uh, our supporters sun pharma and uh, chowda sir apurva sir uh dr rosil and dr sridhar uh, for uh, participating in this talk thank you very and much. thank you thank you dhawal good day for initiative. a wonderful talk thank you all the panelists thank, thank you thank you everybody thank okay. you thank you and, enjoy and now a uh, quiz uh, for the uh, the viewers and uh, we will uh, uh, soon uh, give you a, a this book uh, medical book uh, for the winner so i think we can start uh, uh, this quiz
uh, those who have previously attended our webinar they, they can have already downloaded this uh, app uh, app's name is kahoot and this is the game pin code once you enter this pin code you can see the uh, question Uh, Santosh, uh, you can start. Next question. You can dictate question. Uh, I think it's possible. I think uh, they, uh, they can see on their uh, application. So I think mm -hmm. no need to. Uh, mm -hmm.
Uh, congratulations to the all the participants. Thank you, Santosh, for the quiz. And I again uh, thank you to all my panelists. Uh, very uh, and good night to everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.